Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for attending this morning's debate here at uh, Devon's Common Center. Um, it's being sponsored, as you know, by the Lowell Sun and the Fitchburg Sentinel. I'd like to thank um, a special thanks to Melissa Federhoff from the Neshoba Valley Chamber of Commerce, who helped us put this together, and my colleague Chris Tierney from the Sun, who got the PowerPoint together. Um, but most importantly, I'd like to thank all the candidates for attending as well. We're going to go about 65 to 70 minutes. I'll deliver just a couple of very unofficial ground rules um, in a couple of minutes, but I'd like to just introduce my boss, the editor of the Sentinel and Enterprise, and the son, Jim Campanini, who has a very special job today. He has a Salvation Army belt, and he is going to be the timekeeper. So I'd like to have Jim just come up to the podium just for a couple of minutes, please. Listen, I want to thank you all for coming out on this very special day. It's a beautiful day for democracy and to hear these candidates. They're working very, very hard to win your support. And the election is the day after Labor Day, September 4th. So this is our second debate. Our first one was held at Fitchburg State University. And I want to thank, once again, the, the Shoulder Valley uh, Chamber of Commerce for helping us, certainly the candidates. So we hope you will follow along this race in, in all our media newspapers and also on our website. Follow the candidates so you can make an informed choice for the next person to serve this wonderful and great district. With that, I'm going to send it back to Chris Scott and we will begin the debate. Thank you. And I have the bell. No bloviating. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jim. Bloviating is one of his favorite words at these debates. So uh, just a couple of uh, quick ground rules. As I said earlier, we're going to go about 65, 70 minutes. Um, I'm going to pose the questions alphabetically. Candidate Ballinger will get the first question, and we'll just work right down the, work right down the line, OK? Uh, you will be given one minute for a response. And then if there's some rebuttal requested, we'll give you about 30 seconds. And uh, Jim and I have been putting on these debates now for a number of years, and we like to see the candidates get conversational and mix it up a little bit. So if one of you was climbing over another to respond to something someone else said, we'll allow you to do that. Uh, there will be no opening statements, but you will get a one-minute closing statement. Understood, everyone? Okay, great. So without further ado, we'll begin with the questions. Um, here we go. Question one, and this is posed to Mr. Ballinger. What is your biggest issue with American foreign policy today? My biggest issue with American foreign policy uh, has to do with money and politics. And I believe that uh, there's no other explanation for uh, the overwhelming influence of corporations in Washington. Uh, it's all explained by one vote. Uh, just about a year ago, 60% uh, of House Democrats voted for a defense bill $50, 50 billion dollars larger than what Trump requested. Now, there's only one explanation for this. It's uh, Curry in favor with defense contractors. And I really think that until we get money out of politics, uh, we can't really reform the uh, State Department, uh, the, uh, the Defense Department, the way it needs to be reformed. And Jim McGovern uh, spoke very boldly about uh, taking on the Pentagon's waste, fraud, and abuse. Well, let me tell you, that's not going to happen if corporations have friends on both sides of the aisle. So I really think that this is a problem, money and power. Thank you, sir. Candidate Doss. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. This is a great forum. It's a great microphone as well. It seems to be working well. Um, my, uh, my biggest uh, problem with American foreign policy today is the delta between our best interests and our, in our representing our values. Um, Throughout the world, we're doing things that, that you know, violate our values, right? So in Saudi Arabia, as a good example, um, we are spending American military money and equipment um, to kill the Houthis. Now, uh, you know, there are no uh, angels in that battle, but our values are being violated in support of a country that hasn't always supported us in terms of our values. Our strategic interests might be there, but our values are being violated. So American foreign policy needs to be um, consistent in both its strategic interests and support of American values. Um, and that, I think, would be overall my biggest problem with uh, our foreign policy today. 
Thank you, candidate Gifford. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody, and thanks so much for being here. I, this is a really simple answer for me, and that is Trump administration foreign policy. Uh, the Trump administration foreign policy is, uh, he uses the tagline, America first. Well, that sounds great. Of course it does. Um, but this is what, America first foreign policy is actually not a foreign policy. It's a political slogan. And American foreign policy at its best, for the last 75 years, has been defined by values. So American foreign policy at its best is something like the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan is when the United States looks at war-torn Europe and goes in and actually invests both economically and politically to help build societies back up. We have seen this over and over again. There's actually a selflessness about it. And we've seen this not just with the Marshall Plan, but also with initiatives like PEPFAR and through the George W. Bush administration, as well as ridding, say, Africa of the Ebola virus, or things like the Iran deal or the Paris Climate Agreement. This is values-based foreign policy. And, the, and quite frankly, the Trump administration is trying to wind that back. And this has been nonpartisan. Uh, this has been unifying. Our, our foreign policy has def been defined by this uh, level of stability. Um, and I do believe that the Trump administration is trying to unwind that, and I'm incredibly troubled by that. Thank you. Candidate Colton. Thank you. I think our biggest foreign policy crisis, and, and we've seen the, the effects and results of it over the past few years, is terrorism. And the reason I say that is because we have adversaries in the world. There are countries that we have to be mindful of, China, Russia. But the one thing about each of these countries is their leaders um, have a sense of survival. No country is going to want to get into a, a, um, an Armageddon-type battle where they can lose their lives and their country could lose um, its existence. But when we're dealing with terrorism, we're dealing with a much scarier threat. Organized terrorism um, is dangerous because at least the people who were sent out to carry out terrorist policies um, have no sense of survival. They have a sense of um, some kind of skewed, crazy martyrdom, and they're willing to do any kind of death and destruction with no consequences whatsoever. I would add that the worst kind of terrorism and, and is actually the lone wolf kind of domestic terrorism that we've seen in Vegas and some and Parkland, Florida, and even though that may not sound like foreign policy, that's the most dangerous because those people aren't even connected to any organization. Thank you, Mr. Gold. State <coughs> Senator Barbara Tellian. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Uh, I believe that foreign policy needs to be looked through the lens of how we as families are affected at our kitchen table. I believe we need to look at foreign policy through the lens of how it affects our health, our safety, and our economic well-being. And I am very concerned with a foreign policy that seems to be formulated around groupthink rather than looking, taking the hard and deep dive into the complexity that is involved in all of the different foreign policy decisions that we need to make. I believe strongly that we need to be focusing on diplomacy uh, and not saber rattling and not uh, trying to engage in foreign policy through Twitter. I'm very concerned that we have a State Department that has not been uh, replenished and hasn't been filled. People are leaving in droves. So I would say that my biggest concern is that we seem to be more focused on military might as an answer in all foreign policy decisions. Thank you. And candidate Littlefield. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, my biggest concern in terms of our foreign policy is what I see as a shift from a long-term commitment to a multilateral where we, the United States, are part of a fabric of organizations from NATO uh, to the G7, um, which collectively operate to, as a community to ensure that we operate in a stable world, a world that can respond coherently to terrorism, uh, and that we're shifting towards a unilateral approach. I think it's characteristic of this president that he simply wants to be king, if I can use that term. And we see that in uh, uh, shift from <coughs> soft power to hard power. So, Per comments that were made earlier, an increase in the defense budget by $50 billion. Um, the slashing of the State Department's budget by roughly $10 billion, or 30%. Uh, and we see it in trade. So, for example, uh, there's going to be a meeting of the G7 uh, in Montreal, I think it's in Quebec, 
uh, this weekend. And, and the people on the street are saying, well, it's not the G7 anymore, it's the G6 plus one. Well, guess who the one is? That's us. So again, I would like to see us promote, develop, and embed our work and, and the world's work in a, in a coherent set of multi-level organizations that build a multi community and not see us as a rogue actor on the stage. Thank you. Moving on to round question number two. This goes to Beach Doffs. What is the country's most significant foreign policy challenge? Um, that's a good question. Um, look, I think we have quite a few. Um, <clears throat> nuclear non-proliferation is our biggest threat existentially. Um, we have to, uh, you know, we are closer on the doomsday clock than we've ever been since the 1950s to uh, nuclear war. Right? That could be uh, accidental. Uh, it could be uh, intentional. Um, so that's a major problem. But I also think economically, um, trade. Right? We have been sold the bill of goods by prior administrations and uh, representatives on trade. Multinational, multilateral trade agreements do not work. Look at the manufacturing base. Each one of you in this room as a phone that was not made in the United States, nor could be made in the United States. Right? Think about that. Where are those jobs going? So we are losing our shirt on manufacturing and high-tech manufacturing. We've been told consistently that um, if we let trade become free, it will be better for all of us because better jobs will come. Where are those jobs? The Democrats lost the White House again because Americans are fed up that we have supported trade agreements. So that's a major problem. We have to listen to that as well. So um, on the military side, I would say uh, nuclear non-proliferation and its um, enforcement, and then on uh, trade and the economy, it's trade. Thank you, sir. Candidate Gifford. So every day presents a variety of different challenges as far as I'm concerned. I, I, obviously, I, there, there is something that every single person should be alarmed at that's, that's happening right now, which is uh, the way that we're, we are alienating our best allies in the world. So those are Canada, Mexico, our European allies. Uh, this is enormously troubling, and I think uh, everybody should be paying attention to it. Um, and then, of course, North Korea. Uh, but I have, I'm going to focus on three because it's a little bit more overarching. Um, I know I only get one, but I'm going to get three anyway. The first one is terrorism. Terrorism is an obvious answer, but we need to, we still need to be focusing on it, and not just overseas, but also domestically. I think it was Lenny who, who talked about homegrown terrorism and why, even though we're talking about foreign policy, national security, the, the national security challenges surrounding homegrown terrorism are real. The second thing is Russia. Uh, Russia is absolutely, I mean, if, we, if anybody forgets what happened in the 2016 election and does not believe that Russia poses a major national security threat to the United States, is not paying attention. And we simply must, must, must treat them as the, for, as the uh, in many cases, the adversary they are, as far as this is concerned. And the third thing may be a little bit surprising, but I'm going to tell you, and I think it's climate change. Climate change is one of those things that is happening in every single corner of the planet. We're talking about sea level rise. If we want to talk about major refugee crises that are happening in parts of the world like Bangladesh, um, this is something the entire planet needs to be paying attention to. Um, and I do believe it's also a national security challenge. Thank you, sir. Candidate Golden. I think our biggest challenge is how we craft a foreign policy to engage in the world. We've learned bigger lessons from two world wars that we can, cannot isolate ourselves from the world. When there's a challenge, whether it's military or economic, we need to engage. At the same time, we've learned another bigger lesson from Vietnam and Iraq War II and Afghanistan that we can't get so over-involved that we try to uh, commit regime change. It never works. So we have to try to craft a policy that calls for strategic intervention when necessary, when U.S. security interests are at stake, with the help of allies, or at the same time, when there's a grave humanitarian crisis, such as we saw in Syria a few weeks ago. Those are the kinds of situations where we have to be very strategic in terms of our intervention. In terms of economics, I disagree with Beach. I think it's very important, 
for this country to engage in economic partnerships. Economic partnerships produce jobs, they keep prices down, they get us engaged with other countries who would otherwise ally with Ch China in particular. Um, and it's a very, and as far as jobs, most of the jobs that we've been losing have not been because of trade partnerships, they've been because of automation. Um, we've gained some jobs from the global economy, we've lost some, but we've gained many more. Thank you. Candidate Latalia. Thank you. Uh, I do think the overarching concern that I have is that we've lost our standing uh, in the international world uh, with this president. Uh, I think he's shown time and again that he is not interested in working collaboratively with other countries, and I think that is a big concern. Uh, technically, I'm concerned about the uh, impacts on uh, national security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, looking at places like Syria where there is no specific plan. Uh, I have grave concerns about committing troops, committing our young people, and I've attended a number of military funerals in my time serving as a legislator. Uh, I want us to be, have a clear, well-thought-out strategy. And it feels like we're just reacting, so I'm very concerned about that. I agree that climate change is a, is a huge threat uh, to our health and our collective safety throughout the world. Um, and I also believe that we need to engage in our economic interests with trade agreements that make sure that those who live here um, are not losing uh, access to good paying jobs with benefits. Uh, you know, I do believe we need to balance out our need to be partners in trade within the international world with making sure that we don't see the massive loss of manufacturing jobs uh, and a real race to the bottom in terms of protections that happen as a result of NAFTA. Thank you. Candidate Littlefield? So, I, I, the biggest risk for me is that I, we are at risk of isolating ourselves from the world community. Uh, this is uh, related to what I was saying before about being involved in, in the, the multinational, uh, multilateral organizations. But the risk, and we see it in terms of our, the, the recent trade tariffs, that we, have, uh, we are in the process of alienating ourselves from the folks who are our best friends in the world. So are there issues with trade that need to be root balanced? Yeah, maybe. But the point is, I think there's better ways to do that than alienating the folks who are essentially the core of this, this multilateral fabric of the world. Secondly, cyber is a huge threat. It's, um, and it, I worry about it both in terms of uh, state actors, Russia, who we saw uh, in terms of elections recently, and non-state actors. But the, the amount of capital that it requires to operate in the cyber world is considerably less than <laughs> than it uh, requires to operate in the physical world. So big, big threat. And, and then like uh, Rufus, I'm very concerned about the impact of the environment on uh, global stability. The, the biggest doomsday scenarios that I think DOD is looking at are the ones where you have mass migration, mass population shifts due to famine and or environmental uh, upset that makes large regions uninhabitable. So we've got a lot of challenges in front of us. Isolation, <coughs> cyber, and environment are my three big issues. Thank you. And lastly, candidate Ballinger. As a lifelong uh, human rights and social justice advocate, I see corruption as the biggest challenge uh, that we face. And uh, I'll give you a couple examples just from my law school days where I helped form uh, the Committee in Support of Solidarity. And we had to fight back uh, Citibank with trying to bail out the dictator, Daryl Zelsky. And uh, I think we effectively opened the door for solidarity to change the face of Europe. And uh, also while in uh, law school, I saw uh, a PBS series uh, was going to be shown on, on Saudi Arabia. And it was a total whitewash of Saudi society. It was full of Morgan Guarantee Trust and a couple other companies put their profits above our national interests. Now, at the same time that they were making this nice uh, four-hour PBS special about Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia was training uh, jihadis in, uh, in Pakistan. They had these madrasas that were just jihadi factories, you know? And that, that's why Osama bin Laden found such a nice uh, place in Tora Bora, is because all of these uh, went to these schools uh, that trained uh, with Saudi money. And then lastly, I uh, say that there's uh, millions of dollars spent uh, trying to influence our government solely for the profit motive and putting the profit motive above our national interest. Thank you. 
Chris, do I get a second to yeah, talk to Len? Yeah, you guys just need to speak up when yeah. you offer a little bit of rebuttal. I mean, I think Lenny's just wrong, right? Fundamentally, it's a, misunder uh, a misunderstanding of trade policy when you uh, create you know, multilateral agreements. Think about it this way. In a mathematic equation, you have variables. You can't put 14 variables and try to solve for one. So in a trade agreement, let's say between us and China, I'm not saying no trade, I'm saying bilateral trade agreements. So you say, you sell me a dollar, I'll sell you a dollar. If that doesn't happen, we put in automatic tariffs the next month to balance it out. That is what we need to negotiate with every country with which we do trade. Otherwise, we're trying to solve for too many. Our issues in NAFTA is a good example. Our issues with China, uh, with Canada and Mexico are different. Okay, wrap it up. So, bilateral agreements should replace those multilateral agreements with every country we do trade with. Mr. Golden? Yes. Like 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. The fact of the matter is, if you look at the number of jobs that have been gained by NAFTA, it's been something like close to 5 million. The number of jobs that have been lost by NAFTA have been approximately 600,000. That's a major net gain. Now, I feel for the people that have lost their jobs, no matter how many they are. I, I know that from my own personal experience. No job lost is ever something that you know, we should be you know, indifferent to. But I have a program on how to get people back to work, and that's by giving tax incentives to companies to train, hire uh, and people, and keep those jobs in America. And that's the way we can um, fight this, the problems that uh, come up as a result of trade agreements. This is what China does. They, they help their employees, they subsidize their companies. I don't want to go that way, but we give tax incentives. We can, if China can do it, we can do it. Thank you. Moving on to round three, the first question in this round goes to Mr. Gifford. Mr. Gifford, how should the United States vet refugees from war-torn countries? Uh, um, well, quite frankly, this is something we've been doing for quite a long time, with great success. I mean, this goes to this goes to a much larger question about immigration, who are we in the world, and I'll answer the question, of course, but we have, first and foremost, we need to acknowledge that we are a country of immigrants, um, and that since the beginning of our history, that we have been a shining beacon of hope for oppressed people around the world, and we can't forget that, because I think the essence of the question is kind of politically charged. The essence of the question is that somehow bad guys are going to slip through the cracks. But the fact remains that the uh, that this program, our refugee resettlement program, is probably the most successful in the history of the world, and we cannot forget that. That being said, law enforcement, of course, has to play a role in this. This is something I was I was the U.S. ambassador to Denmark, and um, we had a major refugee. Crisis. In Europe, if you remember, the Syrian refugee crisis happened while I was there in the summer of 2015. And the European countries were actually struggling mightily about how to do this. How can you actually vet these people and make sure uh, that they are in this to actually make their, their community, if they are, uh, if they are uh, given, given citizenship or given uh, the equivalent of a green card or a visa, whether or not uh, they can be viable, viable citizens of the country. It's not easy. But it's about interviews. It's about law enforcement. It's about uh, it's about the basic human connection. It's about uh, working the, the human piece and the law enforcement piece working hand in hand. Um, uh, and 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 that's and that's it's 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 not. I, I think that's the essence of it. In, in short. Thank you, Mr. Golden. We're a country of immigrants, and sometimes we get a little nostalgic and, and forget know the kinds of problems that our ancestors faced in, in coming to this country. I think, you know, as a country that welcomes people, we should have, um, sh should be allowing people to come into this country, vet them properly for two um, exclusions. One is if they're suspected of any criminal activity, for example, drug activity, or two, um, if they're suspected of being uh, part of some kind of terrorist activity. Those to me are the only two criteria by which we should be um, excluding people from this country. Now, when I say criminal activity, I'm referring to things like drugs, um, murder, robbery, people who are escaping countries where they're uh, basically political refugees because um, they've been in opposition to a despotic government. I would allow those people. Um, We've heard criticism that people are coming in and they're not legal. Well, one of the legal bases for allowing people into this country is if they are refugees, if they are escaping a persecu 
persecuting government, a despotic government that's, that's um, um, going to hurt them, or even drug gangs that are, uh, have targeted them for some reason. So I think we need to be much more scrutinizing and much more um, liberal in how we allow people into this country. Thank you, sir. Candidate Latellian. There is a substantive process already in place. You wouldn't know it hearing from this president, but there is a substantive process in place. It's a multi-year process. I had the good fortune to hear from the, uh, the Immigrant Institute in Lowell a year or so ago at, an, at a fundraising event. There is a, a highly regulated, structured process in place already. People don't know that because we're not engaging in fact right now. Uh, the facts are these, within Syria, 15,000 people were resettled in 2016 in the United States. In 2017, we dropped it to 3,000. As of mid-April this year, 11 people. These are people leaving war-torn countries with just the clothes on their back. We have seen what's happened in Syria. Uh, it is emblematic of a, of a dictatorial regime who will stop at nothing to kill people, uh, to keep himself in power. These people just want to survive. They want to live. We need to continue to be the open and welcoming country that we were when they invited my uh, immigrant grandparents in from Ireland and from Canada. Uh, and by the way, uh, failure to do this and engaging in, in rhetoric that is ill thought out and that demonizes certain groups based on their ethnicity or their religious affiliation only serves to grow and play into the hand of domestic terrorism uh, by those who would seek to exploit what the president is saying um, and seek to uh, reach out to young, disaffected people here in this country to grow terrorism. Thank you. Pass the microphone. Candidate Littlefield. Okay, so I think first and foremost that we need to have our values in order here and, um, and refugees are people who are leaving difficult, sometimes uh, you know, almost fatal circumstances simply to, to uh, find a, a more decent life. So in principle, this is a, an issue we need to step forward on and be involved in and participate in. I'll, I'll note that you know, many of the, uh, the Irish who came here to this area were essentially uh, economic refugees or family refugees. They didn't come here uh, just out of curiosity, they came here out of necessity. Uh, however, I would also say this is a global problem and not just a United States problem. So this is where, in a world where the flows of people are probably going to increase and not decrease, uh, we need to be working with multi multilateral organizations. We need information so that we can vet people. And obviously there are bad actors in the world, and we need to be able to, to identify them and filter them out and then bring people into what is already a strong program once you get here. But that working, the informational resources, uh, the international partnerships which would allow that to function are something that we've got to work on. And I, I fear, again, that our president is moving us in, in, this, uh, in, a, in a direction that, that uh, decouples us from, from the partners that we should be having in the world. So uh, let's step forward, let's do the right thing, but let's work with this as a global issue and not just as a, as a isolated national issue. Thank you, sir. Candidate Ballinger. Now, I'm married an immigrant from a Muslim-majority country, so Trump's America, I probably, we might not even have met. Uh, that's where we're at today. Um, I also worked in Afghanistan uh, 2012, 2013, side by side with our uh, soldiers there, and uh, I helped some of our translators who were, they saw us winding down, and they were trying to apply for uh, U.S. Uh, green cards, and. Uh, the vetting process is robust, let me tell you. They are, uh, even these proven friends of America had a very difficult time you know, getting into uh, our country. And some of them were at great risk if they stayed in Afghanistan. The province I was in, about 100 miles south of Kabul, uh, according to the New York Times last week, is going to fall. It's going to fall to the Taliban. So it was, uh, it was contentious when I was there. It's almost a lost cause now. And some of our translators were Hazara, you know, a different ethnic group, a different religious group than uh, most in this Pashtun area, and they were at great risk. And so, uh, you know, my heart really goes out to them. And they're, they're, we have to differentiate also between uh, asylum seekers and refugees, because asylum seekers, by law, I mean, America has to deal with these uh, people, and Europe is really under a uh, great challenge right now uh, with asylum seekers. But for, for refugees from war-torn countries, 
I can attest to the fact that there's a very good vetting process already, and uh, we should be doing more. Uh, the, the prospect of following what happened with Libya and with Gaddafi, uh, although those two things were conflated, uh, the, the denuclearization happened, and then a, a number of years later, uh, you know, he was uh, killed in terms of a, a military overthrow. Um, I'm grateful to see that he realized that removing Bolton as the lead on this reduces or drops the temperature in the room. Um, I think we always need to be about, uh, about diplomacy. I think that looking at military strikes is quite premature. Uh, I don't think that's where we ought to be. Um, there's some question as to whether or not this is going forward because uh, the North Korean leader wants to raise his, uh, his own um, you know, uh, profile in the international world. It's unclear if China is back channeling uh, with North Korea because they are also involved in this to a degree. But whatever the reason, I think that we need to be about trying to seek diplomatic uh, efforts for first and foremost, and doing and not doing military <coughs> strikes. Thank you, Kennedy Littlefield. So I think, the, uh, first of all, I'm delighted that we're having the conversation with North Korea and, and like Barbara, I give it to the President. Uh, kudos for, for being part of that dialogue. However, uh, I think we need to look at the big picture here, and the reason that uh, Kim Jong Un is at the table, I believe, is because the sanctions that have been imposed progressively over the last six to eight years are working, and that that uh, country is increasingly under economic duress, and his ability to fulfill his promise to his people that he was going to make their life better is actually diminishing daily. So we need to keep the pressure on. With respect to the current dialogue, um, my, my, my expectation is that this is going to be a first in a series of conversations. There's lots of background conversation going on. I don't think that anybody's going to, I don't think that Kim Jong-un is going to give up his nuclear power in this conversation. With luck, this will be the onset of a longer dialogue which will allow us to denuclearize the peninsula, but it's going to take time and parallel steps on both sides. The risk that I worry about is that we prematurely give away some of the economic kind of leverage that we have got today. And by the way, I'll say that's also being, you know, we've got China's on board. Even China has basically agreed to, uh, to not provide uh, materials to North Korea, as well as uh, South Korea and other members of the international community. So keep, stay there. And you're heading to the opposite end of the peninsula, candidate Gallagher. Well, I would definitely not be considering military strikes, and I think we've got to lower the temperature, and part of my plan for lowering the temperature would be to reduce troop levels, uh, not only in the DMZ, but uh, uh, in South Korea itself and, uh, and elsewhere in, in Europe as well. But uh, as far as North Korea is concerned, what is working, to build on uh, Patrick's point, is not only the sanctions, but also the enforcement of the sanctions. I'm a big enforcement person. I really think that what we do, we have a lot of good laws in immigration, for example, but they're not enforced very well. Uh, and the IRS, we keep cutting the staff of the IRS, even though every 45 cents you spend gets you $100 in revenue. But what I mean by enforcement in this context is we're stopping ships with, with satellite imagery. We're able to stop ships trans transit, uh, they're offloading uh, goods for uh, North Korea uh, in, the, in, in the sea somewhere, and they were doing it with impunity for the last uh, 20 years. So no matter what sanctions you had, you had sanctions busting going on. And I think this is uh, the key to getting Kim to the table, uh, Kim Jong-un, was uh, they started really getting serious with our Australian uh, partners and the uh, Japanese uh, using satellite technology to really enforce those sanctions. So I would keep them, uh, keep the pressure on. Thank you, Sir Kennedy Doss. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, look, I, I think we have to look at what has happened under the Trump administration to understand the, you know, the shift here. Right? Under Obama, President Obama said, you do the denuclearize first, and then we'll talk to you, right? And that's, it's, it's impossible for Kim Jong-un to do that. He has 30 nuclear warheads, unlike Libya that had, you know, that not the end none. So we were asking the impossible. Now, then we have President Trump, whose erratic, acerbic um, foreign policy, suddenly he says, well, I'll talk to anyone, right? So it's a, it's a, 
it's a seismic shift. I, I don't think any of us on this, let's be honest, I don't think anyone on this panel, you know, eight months ago said this is a good idea. Now we're all saying, hey, Trump's doing a great job. He, you know, he's bringing people to the table. All I'm suggesting, I think, on this is that military strikes, if that's out of the question, and would require congressional approval. And let's keep that on. Uh, Bolton doesn't think he needs approval. Keep that in mind. It needs congressional approval if we were to ever consider uh, a military strike in North Korea, which I disagree with. But you know, this discussion that's happening is a seismic shift from the policy under President Obama. We should also keep that in mind as, as something uh, as we frame this discussion. And wrapping up this round, candidate Gifford. Yeah, thanks. I, and the answer to the question is, I think we're a very, very long way from any a, any consideration of military strikes. Uh, but as far as the North Korea summit is concerned, I I, I certainly don't say what you said that candidate President Trump is doing a great job. I, I think I have enormous concerns about this. I. Look, I have no problem with a conversation with the North Koreans. I actually think that's vital uh, if we are going to achieve denuclearization. But the thing about diplomacy, the thing about foreign policy, is that it takes time. It takes tact. Diplomacy doesn't happen overnight. It, it happens because um, there's a lot of work that goes uh, that that precedes a summit of this magnitude, and then you work together with your allies in order to ensure that there is a successful outcome, and that's critically important here. So my fear with the North Korea summit, very specifically, is that Donald Trump is trying to score a political win here, which is not going to result in greater peace for the world. Now, if look, I, I, I will, I will. I promise you give him the benefit of the doubt at this point. And I hope to God that this summit results in a conversation that leads to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But this administration has absolutely showed no tact, no finesse, or no investment in diplomacy. And so I have great fear about June 12th. Um, but look, you know, I'm, I, I hope, I hope to God that I'm wrong. I think there's a vortex between the 12 inches between us. I never said Trump was doing a great job, so I don't, I don't know what, what was created in this space that you didn't hear. But uh, look, it's not about Trump doing a great job. It's, is this a good idea? And right now, we're all saying it is. You know, a year ago, none of us, I'm, I'm sure I probably said, look, this is crazy that we should go through the diplomatic process. That didn't happen, and now we're speaking to North Korea, potentially, in, in, in you know, five days from now. But there's a difference between going through the diplomatic process and having a bilateral meeting with Kim Jong-un and, and Donald Trump as, as quickly as this is happening. I fully support the diplomatic process. Um, I am concerned about the bilateral meeting, especially, look, Kim Jong-un is, is What's this? Uh, is Assad is going to North Korea right now? What, what is uh, what's, what? What is this? What is what? Is, what does he have in this? Uh, uh, there's so much more. But this is so much more complex than anybody in, than anybody in this room knows. Um, and we have to look at it that way, as far as I'm concerned. Any other candidate on this? Yes, I'd like to weigh in on this. Um, yeah, it's often said that somebody's greatest <clears throat> strength can be their greatest weakness. And with Trump, he has no filter, no regard for any past precedent or protocol. In actuality, that was a good thing in getting these talks started. He just didn't know or was aware or care uh, that there had been a past precedent of establishing some preconditions before meeting. That's good. As a result of that, we're having this meeting. On the other hand, there, there is an importance to having some kind of protocol, at least to the point that you don't have your vice president uh, say that uh, if we don't get this done, that, uh, by the way, can, we can end up like Gaddafi. That's not exactly the kind of thing that um, builds on a kind of spirit in a, um, in a uh, conference. So I would say it's good that the conference is going forward. Maybe it's, and maybe it's better that the two of them meet together to keep all these other people like Pence and that North Korean foreign minister at okay, right, 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 the conference. Yes, candidate Latelia. Thank you. I just want to make sure that what I was saying was, you know, We've been all over the place, right? We've been, we've come from tweeting about the size of the nuclear button to setting up a meeting, rescinding that meeting, uh, engaging in inflammatory uh, talk about the Libya uh, model, to coming back to coming together. I think everyone in this panel understands that this is complex. Everyone understands there needs to be a 
you know, a move for diplomacy, and the State Department needs to be fully staffed up. We don't even have an ambassador to Korea right now. So, uh, you know, I think we all understand uh, that this is complex, but I think that we need to still be hopeful and grateful that we are engaging in diplomacy. This could fall apart in a minute, I think we all understand that, but this is so much better than trying to look at, uh, you know, limited nuclear strike, which has been talked about, uh, military strikes, which has been talked about. You know, are there unreasonable expectations here about full denuclearization? Perhaps. Uh, is Kim Jong-un perhaps engaging and looking legitimate uh, to satisfy the, the Chinese? Perhaps. But the important thing is that we are starting a conversation. Thank you. Mr. Ballinger? <laughs> Nothing to add. Nothing to add? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lutherford, Mr. Ballinger? Anything no. to add on this? Okay, we'll move forward to the next round. And I believe this goes to Senator Latalian. Well, I can, um, we're having a technical difficulty here. Uh, question number five, uh, should military incursions into, for, into a foreign country require congressional approval? Absolutely. I believe that we have gone so far from, and I'm speaking about Congress, has really gone so far from, uh, you know, they've relinquished their power. Uh, they did so, um, they have not been uh, through the authorization of military force, which arose as a result of 9-11. Uh, there have been many instances where they have just given up their power to have any say on whether or not we should be engaging in war, uh, what those confines should be. Look, at my, I have my 20-year-old son sitting here today who drove me here to this uh, event, and he's, he had to go sign up for the Selective Service when he turned 18. And I think that we need to take very seriously every time we are potentially putting a young man or a young woman's life on the line. And I think this should not be decided strictly by the President. I think that we need to take back uh, our power and we need to be part of this, and we need to weigh in on each of these incursions. Thank you. Kennedy Littlefield. So this was a, this is a really interesting question of one of my study and anticipation of this debate. Uh, so if you look at the Constitution, the Congress has the right to declare war. The President is you can speak just a little louder, I'm sorry. Um, so if you look at the Constitution, the Congress, uh, the, the, the Constitution reserves to the Congress the right to go to war. But the president has the power of the commander in chief. Uh, I think clearly, I would like to ensure that when we are considering war, that it is the Congress that makes that decision, not the president. At the same time, I you know that you use the term incursion, a term that's neutral with, with respect to whether or not this is a war scenario or a sub war scenario. And I do think we need to reserve to the president the right to engage in certain kinds of military action, I'm going to use that term carefully, uh, that falls below the threshold of war. So uh, I'll note that this is a careful balance. I want to make sure that we, we, uh, we understand it and embrace kind of the constitutional division and not kind of over the playing field with respect to kind of a particular <coughs> president at this time. Uh, that said, I do worry greatly that this president will exercise military authority without due oversight and that that is a great risk for us and for everyone. Thank you. Candidate Ballinger. I would just use Afghanistan as an example of the unbelievable to me that for 17 years we've been there and Congress has never debated this. This is, uh, it's really not acceptable uh, on any level. I mean, I, I'm mostly concerned about the troops. The troops have to know, you know, what the plan is and uh, why we're there. Uh, I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of our ambassadors in uh, Afghanistan. We had five ambassadors at one time after the Obama surge when I was there. And uh, he was the rule of law ambassador, and I told him that there, the Dutch and the German space agencies had satellite monitoring of smuggling routes. This is a very mineral-rich country, Afghanistan. So they had the data we needed. He said, what does that have to do with the rule of law? And I was disbelieving. I, I said to myself, it has everything to do with the rule of law. If you're going to build a mining 
uh, industry in, in, in Afghanistan, uh, you have to stop the smuggling. But we're protecting warlords and corrupt politicians, and that's the reason we didn't want to use this data. I think we have to debate Afghanistan, and it's not enough to have the special investigator general for Afghan reconstruction issue a 200-page report every six months. We have to debate this in Congress, and I was willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this ambassador and tell him that we needed to uh, use this to uh, help the mining. We've, we've been helping the mining ministry for 17 years, tens of millions of dollars, and there's still no mining law in Afghanistan. So if you want to have a mining business, you don't have the framework to build one on. So they need the revenue. We need to stop the smuggling. Thank you, sir. Candidate Das. Uh, Patrick, I'm the constitutional lawyer here, and uh, I give you an A minus on your rendition. It's pretty good. Uh, I'm, glad I got, I'm glad I got that there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a tough grader too. Um, so the uh, authorization of the use of military force from 2001 and 2002. Um, that happened after 9-11 and uh, the incursion by Saddam Hussein. Uh, those are still operating. So we have a permanent war. We are active, the United States is active militarily in 19 countries right now, in active aggression. So I think we do need to re-look really at what we, because remember, we have a president that has now said he can pardon himself, right? That was the uh, innovation from this week. And that, um, you know, we have a new, it's not clear that he thinks he needs authorization even to do a first strike nuclear attack. Right? I mean, we're, we're talking crazy times. So we do need to scale back and look at the Constitution as Patrick has done and say, well, Congress was always intended to be part of the use of military force in active combat. Yes, if there are other situations that require very quick action that are not continuing military actions, uh, but in this situation, absolutely, congressional approval, yes. And I, 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 yeah, and, I, and I, I agree with most of what's been said. I think that um, this is how I look at essentially that short chapter post 9-11 and some of, some of the legislation that, that, uh, that resulted. It, that there were certain things that we did as the United States of America that were not consistent with what I believe American values are. Uh, that, led to, that led to torture programs, that led to Guantanamo, Ab Abu Ghraib, some aggressive surveillance programs. And I do believe in some ways AUM AUMF is connected to that as well. Um, so I do think it needs to be looked at. I think it's far too broad uh, and, I, and it has no, and, 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 it's, uh, and, and it's endless in essence. Um, and let me, I have, some ex I have some experience with this too. I was in a place as ambassador where I had to go to a NATO ally and ask for their parliament to support military intervention in Iraq and Syria. Now what does that mean we did? Of course we brought the political parties together because they needed to have a majority vote in parliament. And, but what they were doing, and it's similar to what I think Patrick, uh, Patrick was talking about, which is uh, their, their laws are similar to ours, is that it provided a more narrow um, it, legal framework, but for example, they were allowed by parliamentary order to conduct military actions in Iraq, specifically, for a two-year period. That extended to Syria with another parliamentary vote. But they, they, they had a certain level of flexibility, meaning their military, we, every single strike did not have to be authorized by parliament. And I, so I think there is a middle ground here. I think there's a way you can do it that is not as broad as AUMF. Thank you, sir. And lastly, candidate Goldberg. Thank you. I think as a result of the nuclear age after World War II, the <clears throat> president, a lot of powers, um, because of the feeling that uh, the president needed that authority to act quickly if there was a, some kind of an emergency. And so the president does and should have police powers up to 30 days to deal with any kind of crisis. But beyond that, I think that Congress has to take the reins and resume its responsibility as it's given under the Constitution to assert itself in any kind of um, actions overseas. <coughs> now, depending upon what the nature of the uh, issue is, that's, that should determine what level of uh, congressional involvement. If it's something doing some kind of humanitarian long-term effort, that could be a resolution by both houses of Congress. But if it's actual combat, then it should require a, an act of law, a, an act of war, just as the Constitution requires. And I think if we put in those constitutional balances 
and Congress reasserts the goal it was intended to, that we'll have a much saner and uh, much more rational policy in the end. Go ahead, Barbara. Yeah. So with regards to AUMF, there's actually some forward movement on this happening right now in Congress. Uh, there is a proposal by uh, Senators Corker and Kane, which essentially is a movement just to uh, legalize what's been in practice over the years. Uh, and it sets out specific groups like Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, et cetera, uh, which we would engage in and allow this uh, continued um, use of force by the president. The big concern I have is that there's absolutely no sunset clause within that, and it seems as though it is just try it's their attempt to legalize this pre this situation that has been in practice for many many years. There's an alternative proposal out there by uh, Mr. Merkley who would set up a three-year um, sunset on this and would require that you affirmatively vote to go in and use force, whereas the Corker Kane. Uh, proposal would only have you weigh in if you want to block. I think we have completely, as a Congress, stepped away from the War Powers Act, and we need to take back that power. Thank you. We'll start the next round, which happens to be the Sun Lightning Round, with candidate Littlefield. These, this is, these questions were posed for quick responses. Okay? Should the U.S. Embassy in Israel be located in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem? Uh, my preference would be that we would have kept it in Tel Aviv. Thank you. I would have kept it in Tel Aviv. There were always supposed to be two, right? One was supposed to be for the Palestinian state and the two-state solution, and, uh, and uh, Tel Aviv was going to be the, the Israeli. So uh, this is just a political shift. Bizarre. Thank you. Candidate Gifford. Uh, at this point, Tel Aviv. Candidate Golder. Jerusalem. Anybody that's been there knows that the Knesset Prime Minister of West Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, the new um, part of Israel since its independence. East Jerusalem. Thank you, sir. Senator will tell you. Well, I agree with Lenny that uh, that may be where the Knesset is located. The political ramifications and what we've seen in Gaza as a result of moving into uh, you know, into Jerusalem, uh, I think we should have waited and we should have had it in Tel Aviv. And I do believe there ought to be a two-state solution and there should be uh, East Jerusalem for the Palestinians. Thank you. Next question goes to the no, not on the lightning round. Next question goes to Mr. Ballinger. Should the U.S. close its prison in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba? Yes, uh, Guantanamo should have been closed during the Obama years, and uh, whatever it needs to uh, take, we, we have to do it. We have to do it. Candidate Das. Yes. Please pass the microphone. Yeah. The answer is absolutely. I would love to talk more about this, but it's. But, you uh, can. but I can. Uh, it's incredibly complex, is the issue. And, and we have to understand that we have people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed at Guantanamo Bay, mastermind of 9 11. What do you do with him? And that's a huge, huge, bigger question than yes or no. Candidate Colder. Yes, it should be t disbanded. We've got nothing from it. And anything that we do need, we can do through the criminal justice system. Candidate Latalia. Yes, because it's been symbolic of wa waterboarding and other things, but I agree with uh, Rufus that we need to figure out a plan where we are going to put the really dangerous folks that are housed there. And candidate Littlefield. Yes, it's a patch uh, for a problem that we need to solve long term, which is how we deal with these international uh, threats. Thank you. We'll move down the table to Mr. Das. Um, Mr. Das, 10 words or less, what should be done with Julian Assange? Get him off the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give her, yeah, take the that. microphone, please. I actually love that idea. Yeah, I, I, it's, uh, I, it, what, I, I, without taking away his, uh, his internet passwords, I'm not sure what else can be done. But I, I think he's, I, I truly, truly do believe he is an international bad actor. Kennedy Colbert. Well, I just think it's a matter of free speech. Let him say or speak what he wants. Kennedy Latellian. I think it's a case where someone is so dogmatic that they fail to see the bigger picture and some of the harm that they've caused. Um, I, 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 I sympathize with the free speech issues. On the other hand, I, I believe he is a bad actor who is being used by other bad actors and therefore we need to shut him down. Yeah, I can think. We can't no, 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 uh, This question goes to <laughs> Mr. Gibbard. Yeah. Should all teams yeah, upon their balance? Okay. Uh, Oh, okay, Mr. Ballinger, I'm sorry. Should all teens upon their 18th birthday? No, no, no. 10 words or less. Assange. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, I, I do think he's a bad actor, but uh, there ought to be some kind of tribunal where, you know, people are hurt and uh, vote one side or the other because it's an issue worth discussing. I apologize to you, sir. Mr. Gifford, should all teens upon their 18th birthday be required to perform one year of military service? Oh, I, I mean, no. Thank you. Mr. Golden. No, I have a better plan. Uh, loan forgiveness and they can do something in their chosen career and that's public service. Candidate Latelia. Agree with Lenny. I think that people can do uh, some sort of service to our country. I think it makes you better prepared as a student. I mean, we've seen this with Israel with their service. I don't think it should be military service, however. That can be an option. Mr. Bloomfield? So I, I concur. I, I favor a, a national service program, but it should not be restricted to military service. It should be public service. Program. Thank you. I'm not going to forget you this time. Mr. Bell. National service, not military service. Military service can be an option, but uh, no, I, I'm very much in favor of uh, national service, but not just military. Thank you, sir. And candidate does. I love how we change these questions. So, yes, sure. <laughs> national service would be great. And I think we're wrapped up on that one. Last question, I think this goes to Mr. Golder. Uh, which country poses the biggest threat to the U.S., North Korea, Iraq, Russia, China, or Mexico? I think long term it's China. I think it's been true for many years. Um, even in the depths of the Cold War, um, when Russia seemed to be, when we seemed to be on the brink of nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis, China has always loomed as the major power. Russia is very transparent. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Candidate Italian. I have to say right now, I believe it's Russia. Thank you. I'm inclined to, to go with Russia. Uh, China's a lot more rational, I think, than Russia appears to be this time. Get China has been our biggest uh, enemy for the last 20, 25 years, and stealing technology, and it doesn't stop there. Thank you, sir. Can I toss? Militarily, Russia, economically, China. <laughs> Can they give yeah. I was going to say the exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it's what I agree. I, from a national security standpoint, I think it's Russia economically. I think. Thank you, sir. I think we have time for one more question before the closing statements. We'll go to question number six. I think this goes back to Mr. Ballinger now. We've been through the line. Should the U.S. give foreign aid to countries uh, who do not give women or minorities equal rights? Generally speaking, no. But there should be an exception uh, made for some countries that we think we can turn. Uh, in Pakistan, for example. I'm sure that there are some restrictions on women in Pakistan that, uh, that uh, we might find unsavory, but I think we can turn that, uh, that country around. And when Richard Holbrook was asked if we weren't giving too much money to uh, uh, Pakistan, too much aid, maybe a billion dollars a year or something, he said it should be five times that amount. And I'd sort of agree with that. If we took a quarter of what we spent in Afghanistan, and put it into Pakistan, we could have avoided lots of problems with the Taliban. And uh, you know, I really think that you know we have to be selective. And I'm generally in favor of restricting aid to people who are similarly minded to us and have the, uh, 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 the rights and uh, privileges uh, across the board, gender and uh, uh, for sexual preference or whatever. But there are places we have to work as a matter of national security that uh, don't fit that. Thank you, sir. Kennedy Toss. So when, you, when we started this debate, you asked what was the biggest foreign policy challenge, and I said uh, the challenge is between our strategic interests and our values, right? But look here. Uh, three quarters of the countries that we give foreign aid to would not qualify under that definition if we said no. But we do have strategic global interests that require us to to give foreign aid in, in areas where there aren't the same values. And I think we have to look at, you know, return ourselves to the thought that what are we trying to achieve, right? And we're not trying to replicate our own country in those foreign countries in which we give aid. So we have to keep that in mind. So um, reluctantly, I would say, um, we would continue to give foreign aid in countries because there are strategic interests. That said, we should always try to push our moral and our values interests as well. 
think is organic. I, I, I agree in concept. I think it should be a consideration, but not necessarily a litmus test. Because I think that the issue here is what. So what's the purpose of foreign aid in, in many instances, and what it sh what should it be? It would be to uh, try to prevent, to see a, a situation that is troubling on the ground, and actually invest uh, economically to try to stabilize that unstable political situation. And again, I think it does, uh, the end, it's all, we all have to think about end game. We all have to think about the fact that if we do invest in, say, Syria, um, will this, could this have, this is Monday morning quarterbacking. Still great concerns there, and I think that we need to be focused on how we can help them uh, with uh, concerns around corruption in their government, concerns around uh, delivering basic human needs, so making sure that they have education and that they have health care and that uh, they have a reliable infrastructure, electrical grid, et cetera. Um, I think all of these things would go a long way towards ensuring that those countries can uh, move towards a more democratic society. I think you have to address those basic human needs first, uh, and then I think you can look at these other issues around uh, uh, equal rights, and so I, I think that as we move out of those countries, we realize that might didn't really solve the problems. There are many concerns that remain, and I think, again, we need to, if we want to be credible, we need to look at helping uh, those folks that are struggling day to day. Thank you, and Kennedy Lucas. Um, so the problem of human rights in the world is, is long term. It's going to be with us in many forms for many years. Uh, I favor uh, continuing to use our leverage where we can to advance human rights uh, uh, in general. On the other hand, I think we have to understand that, that we can operate, I believe, most effectively here in coalitions, where we continue to build within those coalition, coalitions a set of shared values. That we cannot police the world by ourselves, that we have to lead by example, that being engaged far exceeds not being engaged. Uh, one of my early uh, mentors in the business world said, the, the hardest thing to know is when to go for a half loaf and when to go for a whole loaf. Um, and I think in, in this area, this is an example where the world is full of grays, other cultures, other value systems. Our power is limited, and the best thing that we can do is lead by example, building a global community that is committed to, to rights so that it's not just us. Thank you. Well, our plan coming into this morning's event was to go about 70 minutes this first session and we're approaching that, so we'll do the closing statements now. And you'll each have about a minute. And we'll start at the opposite end of the table. Mr. Bluefield, you can go first and we'll go right down the line. Great. So again, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, I want to ask for your support in this race. My key focus areas are jobs in the economy, healthcare, and access to education. I know we haven't talked about those today, uh, but I just want to kind of bring us back to basics and bring us back here to the district. So. Uh, as a person who's built a business that today is employing almost 300 people in, in good jobs, the jobs of the future, I know how, how what that, that looks like. I, hope, I know how to make it happen. Um, in terms of health care, health care and education are two uh, necessities of life, and they're bankrupting a lot of folks. And in both of those, I think we need to, we need to look at how we refactor the cost and access for those issues. Uh, with respect to health care, my belief is that we need universal health care and that we need to pay for it through a single payer mechanism. With respect to education, I'd like to see us uh, ensure that everybody has access to post-secondary education, whether that's a vocational education, a technical one, or a four-year liberal arts education. Um, so, uh, and, and the National Service Program we talked about today for me is one of the ways that you re-engineer the economics of the education system. I think we've got to look at new methods of both delivering education and health care. But if we don't do those things, the, the great working middle class of everyday Americans is increasingly not going to be able to participate in the economy. And if that happens, we risk looking like other places in the world that are uh, unstable, where you've got one class pitted against another. And I don't think we need to. I don't want to say that here. So let's rebuild this bill. Thank you, sir. Kim Italian. Thank you. Uh, you know, the reality is, a freshman in the House of Congress is going to have very little uh, import on foreign policy. That said, as a mom, I believe we need to bring it back to the kitchen table and make sure that our foreign policy meets three, goes through three basic lenses. The first being health, 
And certainly with what is going on with global warming, there are incredible concerns around health, the, the spread of disease, uh, the concerns about uh, you know, water, water rise, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of safety, I think we need to have a national security plan that is thoughtful, uh, that is strong, decent, and thoughtful. Um, in terms of economic plan, I think it again has to be value-based. Uh, it has to connect to the economic interest of those working people here in the third congressional district. For example, steel and aluminum tariffs will not only assure that more microwaves and other small appliances will be made in Korea and in China, but they're also going to be more expensive. Okay? Um, and in terms of tariff retaliation, we really didn't get into any of that, but the kind of short-sighted and knee-jerk tariff retaliation that we see being brought forward by, the pres by President Trump uh, could cost real jobs here in this district. Uh, at places like MKS Instruments in Andover, or at Kronos in Lowell, or at Micron in Fitchburg. We need to have a sensible trade policy uh, that is going to uh, be fair, ensure that we are not a race to the bottom, that we are not giving away more manufacturing <coughs> jobs, uh, and that we are being sure that people are able to have good paying jobs. And so we have a lot to think about and a lot to work towards. And I will always take that frame and my values as a mother of four to make sure that your economic interests are considered and well served. Thank you, and candidate Goldberg. Well, foreign policy may seem something very arcane and distant and, and not relevant, but in many ways it does impact on what we do here at home in terms of our domestic issues. And our biggest concern is education. We need to be number one in education in the world in terms of Every, every endeavor, whether it's math, science, liberal arts, we need a strong educational system. We need strong federal aid to improve our education standing in the world. That was true back during the space age, um, during the Sputnik era, and it's ever more true today. So education should be a top priority. Another issue that's very important has to do with job security. And this is where we get into all these concerns about economic partnerships. The fact of the matter is, we can do very well in a global economy with economic partnerships, but we have to do what China has done, and that's help support the creation of jobs in this country. That's why I favor tax credits to companies that train, hire, and keep jobs in America. China subsidizes and basically runs their companies. We don't want that kind of system. But the concept of supporting and creating job growth is something that we can learn from them, and we can certainly do better than they do. And finally, there's the whole issue of security from terrorism and, and, our, and our constitutional rights. I think we need to balance that out. We need to get rid of Guantanamo, get rid of the Patriot Act, and let law enforcement do what is done very well. That and the criminal justice system can serve us well Thank fight you, terrorism. Yeah, thank, you. thank you all so much for being here. Um, so, one thing I've learned in my life is that diplomacy and politics actually have a lot in common. Uh, when I first arrived in Denmark uh, as ambassador, uh, I realized that there was an enormous gap of trust that existed between people and the institution that I represented, which was the largest bureaucracy in the world, right, the US government. And so what I tried to do when I arrived in Copenhagen was actually get out from behind my desk, connect with people, engage with them on the issue. Uh, use a degree of sincerity, authenticity, and whatnot to build trust, not just between the government of Denmark and the government of the United States, but between Danes and Americans. And when Donald Trump was elected president, I realized that I wanted to come home and step up my level of service, which is a big reason why I launched my campaign in November of last year. And so many of the things that I learned as ambassador, this great skill of diplomacy, I am attempting to use right here on my campaign trail here. I've traveled to each one of the 37 cities and towns in this district and gone coffee shop to coffee shop, diner to diner, uh, living room to living room, and listened, asked questions from every single corner of this remarkable district. And why does this matter so much? Because just like what I learned in Denmark, there is an enormous deficit of trust that exists between people and government, people and politicians. And if we are going 
to achieve the big, bold, progressive agenda that I think all of us on this stage want to achieve, healthcare, education, green jobs, infrastructure, immigration. If we're going to do this, the first thing we got to do is build that trust back. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of congressman that I want to be. Come see us. We have three offices, Fitchburg, Lowell, and Concord. We'd love to have your help and support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Candidate does. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is uh, what a forum. It's great to be able to talk about these issues. I'm Beach Doss. I'm a technology innovator from Lawrence uh, in my youth. I'm a constitutional lawyer. Uh, and for the last 10 years, uh, I've owned a small business uh, right here in Tingsboro uh, that employs 125 people, 75 of them in the district. I have the broadest set of tools in this field. Um, I've done things uh, that I can't imagine in 45 years I would have done. Um, I served our country um, as an ambassador in many ways, economically, for Hilton abroad. When Hilton uh, hired me, they had zero hotels in South Asia. Um, when I left, they had 28, for then the largest American hotel company globally. Barbara talks about <clears throat> her son driving her uh, here. I drove my parents, who are in their 70s and 80s, here today. Um, I worry about long-term economic security, uh, not only for our country, but also um, you know, how is it going to be for mom when she ages in place and dad? So we have to start thinking about these things as adults, right? The dialogue in Washington has moved away from that so far, and I think we need adults at the table who've done a lot of things, who've represented this district in many ways, not just in the political realm. You know, I'm surrounded by folks who are politically active. I have not been um, in the economic, I've, I've been in the economic sphere, not in the political one. I want to join the fight in Washington on behalf of everyone. And I uh, thank you and I ask for your vote uh, on September 4th. Thank, thank you. And candidate Ballinger. Thank you. I did uh, a half a dozen Ford assignments for the AFL-CIO and the Free Trade Union Institute and uh, other organizations, mainly doing human rights and uh, labor rights work in mainly in Asia and also the former Soviet Union. I think that uh, before that, I was also active in international affairs. I took uh, 11 uh, West Bank trade union leaders, uh, teachers union leaders, to meet with Paul Tsongas when he was in the Senate. And he was very gracious and met with us for a long time because he realized these people were taking a great risk. They go back to the West Bank and they're marked people. They are friends, collaborators with the U.S. and with the Israelis. And so we have to take risks for peace. And I really think that that's something that's totally lost now. Uh, we have governments that were taken over by right-wingers in cahoots with radical uh, religious uh, forces, both in the United States and in Israel. So I don't see a path to peace there, and it breaks my heart. Uh, right here we have a story of uh, historic importance. Right here in Devons, the technology of a wind turbine company was stolen by their biggest customer, a Chinese company, Sinovel, and we just won this case. This was in 2011, they lost hundreds of jobs, 700 jobs. We just won this case, the Department of Justice worked on it for seven years. And I talked to the executives at AMSC, and they were very pleased that the Department of Justice, it's historic because it's the first technology theft case ever won, criminal case against a Chinese company. And I think what, what makes me angry is that nobody from the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee thought to call the CEO and uh, some workers down to Washington and say, this is why we have regulation, this is why we have government. The Republicans have demonized both for 40 years, and I think we've got to stand up for government. I'm going to be vocal if I go to Washington. Thank you. Well, that concludes our first session this morning. Thank you to all the candidates. coming out here today as we had a great first session. session this uh, session, we're hoping to get in a couple of extra questions. We have five candidates instead of six. So uh, this uh, session will last for 60 minutes. The first one went a little longer because of the six candidates. I hope that you will continue to follow this race. 
uh, in uh, the, the websites for the Sun, the Sentinel Enterprise, and the Neshoba Valley Voice. And I want to thank the Neshoba Valley Chamber of Commerce for helping us with this joint venture. The election is September 4th, and these candidates have worked hard. So we hope that you will go out and vote and make an informed decision by what you hear today and follow in the, the days and weeks ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. So candidates will stick to basically the same, uh, same rules that we used for the first debate. Uh, we'll start with Alexander, we'll start alphabetical order, and we'll just go down the line. Each candidate will have about a minute to respond. My boss, Jim Campanini, will keep the time. And if you uh, so desire a response, just let me know and we'll open that up. Um, we'll go about 60 minutes, then you'll each get a minute um, to issue a closing statement, okay? So without further ado, we're going to begin, but we're just going to start at the other end of the questions. So question number 12 to candidate Chandler. Should our military be allowed to use interrogation techniques such as waterboarding? No. Um, I'm formerly a member of the U.S. intelligence community. I spent 13 years working at the Office of Naval Intelligence. And part of why I got into this race was being the only candidate with professional experience in national security. And I can tell you with that authority that using these interrogation techniques such as waterboarding does not constitute a value add to our national security. It actually puts our troops in more danger, particularly when the military uses it. And I'm joined in this assessment by none other than Senator John McCain and the overwhelming sentiment of the professionals within the intelligence community. It has been removed from our toolkit as a nation. It is a shameful incident in our nation's history, and it should never be repeated. And if I'm in Congress, I will use my oversight powers to ensure it is never repeated. Thank you. Candidate Cole. This is a question of our values and who we want to be as a country. And do we want to be leading the world by example? We should take out interrogation techniques and insert torture in that question, because I believe waterboarding is torture. And the research actually shows that such torture methods don't even work to extract information from people. So I think we need to restore our leadership in the world, and we need to lead by example. And the notion that we should be waterboarding or other nomenclature around torture to make it sound softer in order to get information that isn't even reliable, I think goes against the very foundations of our democracy. Thank you, candidate Malone. Absolutely not. Um, I just think, for me, basically the reason why we're doing that is because we want to get good, useful information. And if I was in that situation, if I was being tortured, I'll tell you anything. And basically, it's not good information. I'll tell you exactly what you want to hear. So, absolutely not. And when in Congress, I think it's inhumane. It's, um, it's not a good uh, thing that we should be using and it's it's uh, distracting us and it's um, we're not going to get what we need in order to protect our national security. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We should not use any of these kinds of techniques. This comes to three things. What are our values as a country and the things we believe in? We've, it's been demonstrated that these techniques are not effective. They do not give the results that we're looking for. We should, this should have never happened in our country, and we should have an obligation as citizens of the United States to make sure it never happens again. So it's about you know using techniques that do make sense, and interrogation methods are not that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Candidate Trahan. Thank you. I need the microphone more than you, Mona. So I'm not going to drive a wedge on this issue here. I, of course, uh, believe that no, we should not be using torture uh, as a way to get information. Uh, look, we all felt the same amount of shame um, when Abu Ghraib, uh, when there was a spotlight shown on the practices, the torturous practices of Abu Ghraib. And, uh, and look, if we want to maintain our, uh, our standing in the world as a world leader, we do need to lead by example. We do need to hold ourselves to high standards. And, uh, it starts with how we, uh, how we conduct ourselves in, in, uh, in war. Thank you. Question number 11 goes to candidate Cub. Should the United States abandon its role as a global policeman? 
Well, I think, to rephrase that slightly, I think we've abandoned our role as a global leader under this president. This is a president with a reckless foreign policy, one that stands for his ego and whatever he feels like he needs to tweet every day to threaten world leaders, and not standing for the America that we believe in, that my Korean and Lebanese ancestors believed in when they first came to this country. An inclusive America, a one that stands for helping people who need it the most, not the 1% and the big corporations. But that is what this president is standing for. So we need to restore our leadership in the world, and we need to be that harbinger of peace once again. Thank you, Ken Hay Malone. What we're, what we're doing right now, basically, the world doesn't trust us. Everything that we have been doing with getting out of different agreements, different um, the, uh, Paris Accord, the, JP, the JCPOA, um, others are not trusting us. So we are not world leaders, right? We are, we're not acting like leaders. We are the world leaders and we should be having presence everywhere and making sure that um, we, we don't need to be policing and, and, and having other countries being exactly like us, but we need to be role models. People are looking to us. Um, every day, you know, with, with technology and everything, there are young people looking towards us for, for leadership, for, for role models, and that's what we need to act like. And we're not, we're not doing what we should be doing as um, a country that's, that's, uh, that's advanced and leading. Thank you. Can I see it? Thank you for the question. I think what we need to be focusing on is how do we strengthen our role as a global leader? Since this president has taken office, we've seen him conduct diplomacy over Twitter and has completely diminished our role as a global leader. He's made us less safe. He's pulled us out of the Paris Climate Agreement. He's pulled us out of the Iran deal. And today we've learned that Iran has decided to restart enrichment. All of his actions are making us less safe. We need to move towards not making our country isolated from our foreign powers and global partners. His actions are in no way moving our country forward. And what we should be focusing on is making sure that on, the, on June 12th at the North Korea summit, that he actually proposes a real plan. A real plan that can reach an agreement and somehow move our country forward. There are a lot of issues we face, not just in North Korea, but with Iran and also with China. And I think what we need is someone who's competent, who's going to always prioritize diplomacy, use our, our, our allies in a way to work together, and protect human rights across this country. Thank you. Thank you. Kira Trump. Thank you. I would also replace um, the word policeman with the global leader, and that comes with an enormous burden, but one that we are ready to rise up and, and meet again. Look, we need to restore our State Department. We need to ex exercise and emphasize more diplomacy than we have in the last two years. As someone who went to the Georgetown School of Foreign Service, so many of my friends who took the Foreign Service Officer exam have either left the State Department or, they, or they've been terminated. And look, just in the last two years, when I look at all the things that we have done to antagonize <clears throat> our allies, uh, whether it's removing ourselves from the Paris Climate Peace Accord, leading the Iran deal, enforcing a ridiculous Muslim travel ban, and putting tariffs on steel and aluminum. I mean, this is at a time when we need collaboration with our strongest allies and our trade partners. And so, as we look uh, to the high stakes negotiations we're going to be in with North Korea, Iran, I think that this is the time when we have to step up our leadership and work with our allies for those settlements. Thank you. And Kennedy Chandler. I'm sorry to say, we have abandoned our values largely and our historic role abroad for in substitute for with a policy of might is right and corruption enmeshed into our foreign policy, which all too often seems too closely tied to the president's personal agenda as an individual and even the interests of his family. And what I would seek to have us do as someone who spent 13 years supporting American diplomacy abroad is go back to America, the inspirational leader, the example of the world, the America of the Marshall Plan, the America of the champion of human rights abroad during the time of the Soviet Union, and what I think is that we have it within us to do that. We have relationships with allies that simply need 
a new Congress and a new president to restore that leadership in the world that begins with us, but really is centered around being a reliable partner to our friends, a steadfast foe to our enemies when we need to have enemies, and to really transparently seek peace, security, prosperity for all, and efforts against the greatest global challenges from climate change to other issues. Thank you. Can a Malone will open up the next round of question, questions. Uh, what is your solution for peace in the Middle East? <laughs> well, I guess my solution is not to with I think there's problem there's enough problems already and I think what we're doing right now is basically making it worse instead of being um, a neutral arbitrator. So, um, you know, in looking at certain situations, like uh, using the Israel and Palestine as an example, we really didn't need to move the um, embassy to uh, Jerusalem. Um, we, most other countries are in Tel Aviv, and um, basically by moving it, we um, were, were not being looked at as, uh, as a neutral, uh, party who can facilitate peace and um, a lot of uh, what uh, what we're doing now as well uh, creating this trust creating um, just uh, just taking care of ourselves and not uh, and and uh, and uh, you know if it's uh, not benefiting us we're not uh, it's all examples of not helping to create peace and giving the the not using our leadership and 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 making sure that others can see that, it, you know, peace don't get created by by us um, instigating things. Thank you, Kine Matias. Thank you for the question. I'm proud of our country and our values, and the last long-lasting relationships we've been able to build with our allies like Great Britain, France, and Germany. However, we have a president who does not understand any of that. He's against anything President Obama accomplished and his unilateral decision to rip up the Iran deal shows his disregard to our allies and to our reputation as a reliable uh, negotiate, negotiating partner. What we should be focusing on is maintaining direct communication with our allies and partners and even those who do not agree with us on foreign policy. We should make sure that our, our, our State Department is fully staffed and we're maintaining direct communications with these partners. Look, a lot of what we've seen this president do, uh, do goes counter to our values, when what we should be doing is making sure we're not ignited in arms race in, in the Middle East, where we have enough issues and instability. So for me, it's about making sure that we are actually uh, maintaining diplomacy as a priority when we're negotiating with Iran, when we're negotiating with Syria. We've seen six million people be displaced and fleeing their country. Five million of those live in Syria. Three out of four of these refugees are women and children, and I think we should be doing a lot better than what we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny Trahan. Thank you. First and foremost, I think that um, we have an obligation to make sure that Iran is never in possession of nuclear weapons. Um, we have to get back to the table uh, on this deal, a deal we never should have walked away from in the first place. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a tough framework in place for uh, promoting denuclearization, denuclearization uh, as well as uh, a tougher framework around inspections and our sunset clauses. We need to support and protect Israel. Um, they are the only democracy in the Middle East. They are a strategic ally for us in the Middle East, and we need to uh, we need to support them with foreign, foreign aid package, uh, and we also need to support them in, in their defense in that region. You know, I'm going to echo what many have said. We do need to get back to diplomacy. We need to get back to collaborating with our allies. These are complex issues. I'm not going to come up with a single answer on how we <laughs> solve peace in the Middle East. You would all elect me right now if I did. Um, but, you know, we, this is a time when we shouldn't be acting unilaterally. We should be acting in concert with our allies. Thank you. Kiedrick. Jayla? First, we need to reject the arrogance that it can be our solution alone, but that we also have to be certain of the fact that the solution requires American leadership. 
and to take us very briskly through all of it, first we need to get back into the Iran deal so that then we can confront Iran's malign influence in the region as a separate issue rather than enmeshed with that. We need to ensure that we are not seen as partial on either side of the Iranian-Saudi conflict, which is being fought via proxies throughout the Middle East. With respect to Israel and Palestine, we similarly need to show ourselves to be an honest broker there, to lean on Egypt, to allow the supply of proper food, materials, and movement of people in and out of Gaza to alleviate suffering there, and to use our influence on Israel to get them to see the Palestinians as a constructive partner. So we build confidence measures there. And then with respect to Syria, work, yes, with our enemies, with the Russians, work with Iran, work with other players to establish a pathway to at least a reduction in violence that can eventually move to a diplomatic solution. And that pretty much sums it up a lot, <laughs> all at once. Thank you, can they cope? So this is a hell of a question, and I'm the last one to answer it, so that's not great. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is personal for me. Um, my family is from uh, a mountain village in Lebanon. Um, and I went there in 2010 uh, to see it for myself, a beautiful country with beautiful people. And when you go to the south of Lebanon, the hospitals, the schools, the, even the people directing the traffic are not Lebanese police, but Hezbollah. They control a large portion of the country. Hezbollah's army is bigger than the Lebanese army. And when you look and see Israel from Lebanon, you realize how much tension there is how much Israel is at risk, and quite frankly, how much the whole region is at risk. It's especially personally for me today because my parents are currently in Lebanon. So we need to have peaceful, bilateral conversations between Israel and Palestine. We need to think about the larger region, and I agree with regard to the role of Egypt, and also with regard to the Iran deal. And finally, this president and his hasty actions in the Middle East has made us less safe, has resulted in the death of more Israelis and more Palestinians, and under this president, I do not see a path to peace in the Middle East. Thank you. Next round of questions, we'll start with candidate Matias. A question that is related. Is your support of Israel a hindrance to peace in the Middle East? Thank you for the question. No, I don't believe it is. I think that what we saw this president do in terms of moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem without actually negotiating and sitting at the table to talk with our partners is not the direction that we should have moved in uh, for right now. I think the embassy should have stayed where it was um, until we reached negotiations and collaborated with some of our allies. Um, I think there is a way what we should be focusing on is how do we get to a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine. And I think that should be the focus of our attention as a country in terms of our negotiations and direct diplomacy with our partners. And that's what I would support and advocate for if given the opportunity to represent you in Congress. Thank you. Candidate Trahan. Thank you. Um, I don't think my support of the, uh, Israel is a hindrance to peace. Uh, I. Um, I also believe in a two-state solution, unlike this administration, unlike the Secretary of State. I think that we need to continue working to bring uh, Hamas and Israel to the table uh, to negotiate uh, that peace. It doesn't really feel likely right now. We've got a lot of uh, external uh, issues, I think, that we need to deal with um, to make Israel feel safe and protected in the region. Uh, but I don't think that my, my position towards Israel, my, my support of it being our most strategic ally in the, in the region, uh, run counters to finding peace in the, uh, in the long term. Thank you. Candidate Chandler? No, I don't think U.S. support to Israel is a hindrance to peace in the Middle East. I think the character and nature of the current administration's support to the current government of Israel is a hindrance to peace in the Middle East. I've been to Israel in a, in a professional capacity. I've worked with partners throughout the intelligence community and with our diplomats and other tools of national power to prevent weapons to going to terrorists that threaten Israel. So I come at it from that perspective. But what I'll say is that what we need to do is leverage our relationship with Israel to get us back to a path of peace. I agree with Dan that it's not possible under the current administration. But what I would try to do is use my oversight powers in Congress either on the House Foreign Affairs Committee or the Permanent Select Committee of Intelligence to make sure that we are 
laying out the conditions, working with partners in the region, including Israel, to move us back on that path to peace. And I think that we have leverage there to do that. Defensive support to Israel in terms of Iron Dome, David Sling, that can help to ward off Iranian aggression while we can push them to discontinue settlement activities and the aggressive posture that the IDF has had against the Palestinians. We can do all that and that will help move us back to the right path. Thank you, Kenneth Cope. Absolutely not uh, is the answer uh, to the question. Um, the reality is, again, as someone who's been to Lebanon, seen it with my own eyes, when you land at Hariri Airport in Beirut and you take a cab to where you're going, you will see billboards that were made by Hezbollah actively calling for the destruction, destruction of Israel. It's that blatant. And so the understanding that Israel needs to be steadfast in its security and our aid to Israel needs to continue needs to be something that we really need to think about and understand as, a, as something that we need to continue to support. The reality, though, is that the entire region plays into the instability of what's happening in the Middle East. I completely agree with Alexandra on the recommendations of where we need to go on that. And so we need to be steadfast and we need to have bilateral conversations and about a two-state solution. And again, this president does not stand for such compromise, does not stand for such conversation. And a little bit more respect of the role that the U.S. plays, and a little bit more correction, a lot more thought into how we engage our allies around the world is necessary if we want to truly see peace in the Middle East. And we're not going to do that with this president in charge. Thank you, and can't name alone. My answer is very similar to the last one. Um, no, I don't think it's a hindrance um, to peace in, mid in the Middle East. Um, I believe in the two-state solutions, and um, I, I just think of, I believe the way we are doing it and how we are doing it is not, um, it's not helping. It's, um, as I mentioned before, um, we're not, we're not doing, we're not being thoughtful. Um, we are not building trust and, and um, uh, you know, past behaviors of our president is indicating um, things that uh, I, I am, uh, I'm, uh, I truly very doubtful that he, um, you know, he, he will help uh, the Middle East in in um, uh, in making sure that uh, that we um, that uh, that the area and the region is is, uh, is being uh, is is it, sorry is is uh, it's having a, a peaceful uh, basically um, so to answer the question again no it's not a hindrance but it's how we're doing it to make it a hint, uh, to, to not be able to, to get to peace. Thank you. We'll start the next round of questioning with candidate Trahan. Candidate Trahan, should the United States remain a member of the United Nations? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, I feel like this is a trick question. <laughs> but I'm it's reading, not. I'm reading it correctly. Uh, absolutely. Look, we are uh, we are paying our, our dues, our, our two percent um, of our of our GDP, and we need to increase. Uh, you know, we need to increase the use of our uh, of our membership in the UN. Um, I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You know, we need now more than ever uh, the UN and working in, in tandem with our allies to confront the complex issues that are facing us in, in the world. And so for us to leave the UN uh, would be, you know, it would be another mistake. Uh, um, you know, when I think about uh, the UN-led airstrikes in, uh, in Syria, something that was very controversial, something that I think we all probably wanted this administration to get congressional approval for, but it was the right call. Uh, you know, we need to act quickly when a cruel and corrupt regime uh, turns and uses chemical weapons on civilians, and so the UN is there for a reason. Uh, we need to use it to help break our uh, collaboration uh, with our allies and uh, and move, you know, uh, more toward uh, collaboration rather than unilateral um, engagement. Thank you, Can I Chandler. I'm horrified by the question. <laughs> we absolutely must remain a member of the United Nations. 
We created the United Nations in San Francisco. This is ours. This institution is the rules-based international order that came out of the death and destruction of two world wars. We cannot possibly walk away from it. And it's not just about values and lofty words. It is a vital tool and venue for communications, even between bitter adversaries, to take place. And it is here in New York City. So why on earth would we possibly walk away from that? We should double down on what is good about that. We pull back from our role with the UNHCR, which is the Human Rights Commission, as well as UNESCO, which protects um, cultural institutions across the world. We need to go further, and we need to return more to the principles that the UN was founded upon, which is diplomacy first, development first, all of humanity coming together first, and not forget what we learned so painfully in 1939 through 45. Thank you, Kennedy Cole. Uh, I 100% agree. Uh, we've just spent you know, the last 15, 20 minutes talking about how people need to collaborate, that we need to have conversations, that we need to have peace. The United Nations and what the UN does throughout the world is as simple as that. Let's just get uh, honest for a second. There's something incredibly magical about watching people, representatives from all around the world coming together in the UN and talking about how to promote peace and where we could go as a world. That is something that should be promoted. I completely agree with Alexandra that we need to be invested further in the UN and utilizing its platform to promote peace. I remember, again, being in Lebanon, uh, in the southern Lebanon, and seeing two UN soldiers and curious to just talk to them and see their perspective. I walked up to them. There were two Korean guys in Lebanon. That's the closest thing to other Korean Lebanese people I will ever get. <laughs> and it was pretty amazing. And it's just a symbol of the world coming together to protect its allies and to be united. That's what the UN stands for, and I think it really is an example of progress as a world. That's something that we should be promoting. Thank you. Can I go along? Absolutely not. We, yeah, um, yes, we should definitely. <laughs> yeah, we absolutely not get, uh, leave the UN. We should not be leaving the UN. Um, but, there's problems in any relationship, in any groups, in any situation, there's always going to be problems. But we should be listening to each other, working together, and making sure that we're still a part of that team. That's what teamwork and that's what collaboration and everything is about. And, you know, if it wasn't for the UN, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. I, um, you know, being a refugee, um, living in the refugee camp. It's, it was these people that helped us to survive. So absolutely not, and I'm sorry I read the question or <laughs> uh, answered it wrong, but uh, we, no should, we should definitely be staying and we should be definitely looking for ways to continue to improve it. Thank you, and, and lastly, Canada Matias. Thank you. Look, the United Nations protects human rights, women's rights, it's the first responder when we have atrocities happening in other countries. They are absolutely essential to our work in diplomacy and to bringing partners together to find solutions to the many issues we see across this country. So I share many of the same beliefs a lot of my counterparts here on the table have shared and I think it's about how do we strengthen and continue to invest in the United Nations and make sure that our actions illustrate those principles that the UN stands for. Thank you. Thank you. Question number seven will go back to candidate Chandler. What should be done to protect our electronic infrastructure, utility um, election systems, utility grid? With respect to our election systems, um, particularly given the recent experience of the 2016 election, we need to seriously consider replacing almost possibly all the voting machines in this country with paper ballots and audible paper trail so as to ensure the integrity of the vote, at least until the technology can fully ca catch up with the very impressive, speaking as a former intelligence professional, efforts of our adversaries. Be punished and held accountable, and it's not um, the way our president is reacting to this. It's not normal, and um, I think we, we, we need to make sure that um, we hold do, you know, ensure the, the highest punishment for that because, sorry, it's, uh, I, uh, basically, it's, um, you know, it's, 
it's it's breaking our laws Thank and you. we're not doing anything about it. Kennedy Matias. Thank you for the question. Look, all of our intelligence agencies have clearly concluded that Russia intermeddled with our elections. And they intermeddled with our democracy and our free election system, and they should be held accountable. It is that simple. We need to make sure that this never happens again. And in order to do that, we need to strengthen and invest in cybersecurity, and we need to hold real sanctions uh, implemented against Russia. These are all things that I'm committed to advocate if given the opportunity to represent you in the third district in Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Can I draw on? This is where it really sticks coming last. <laughs> um, obviously 2016 taught us that we are vulnerable. Um, the Russians did hijack our election. Uh, they interfered with our democracy. And, uh, and we didn't hold them accountable. We didn't issue any more sanctions. We didn't punish them at all. Uh, for all the tough talk that this president uh, engages in, we are weak when it comes to Russia. And it does beg the question, whose interests are he, is he protecting? His own business interests or our national interests? Time and time again, we have not held the Russians accountable for supporting the Assad regime with, with I mean, they use chemical weapons on civilians, expelling our, um, our diplomats from the country, uh, and in interfering with our elections. One of the reasons I want to maintain our seat on the House Armed Services Committee is so that we can tackle questions like this. There's no question that we need new investments and new innovative technologies uh, when we think about defense. We need new prescriptions, and I'd love to continue the tradition of Congressman Marty Meehan and Congressman Nikki Songus by holding a seat on the House Armed Services Committee. Thank you. We'll start our next round of questions with candidate Cole. Should the U.S. give foreign aid to countries that do not give women or minorities equal rights? This country needs to stand as an example for the world and a leader in the world. The reality is, I believe that under this president, if you're going to talk about minority rights, if you want to talk about women's rights, this president is about the opposite of that example. And so I believe that we need to be promoting these things throughout the world. We need to be using our incredible uh, presence as a country, as well as our foreign aid to be promoting women's rights and minority equal rights throughout the world. Thank you. Can I along? Yes, I think it's important to, um, it might not be there yet, but I think when when we do when we when we offer aid and when we're a, we're a role model so and people as I mentioned before are looking to us and when uh, they see that we are um, uh, when we're advanced and we're advancing women's rights and minority rights um, that will follow so um, it is important to uh, to to do so. Thank you, Kenny Matias. Thank you for the question. I believe that we do have a responsibility to continue to engage with countries that do infringe on people's uh, women and minority rights, but I think it's about how do we engage with them effectively. So I think we should provide aid, but in a direct way that actually impacts women's rights and children's rights and communities of color. Um, and I think we have a responsibility as the free, le free as the leader of the free world to engage with these communities. It's about how we do it in an effective way, and I would support um, continuing to provide aid, but just being effective in the way we do it to make sure that we are, at the end of the day, um, impacting change in a positive way in some of these countries. Thank you. Kennedy Trahan. It, it begs the question, would we qualify for our own foreign aid? Uh, uh, Look, we have a lot of work to do to shift our own imbalance in this country, right? I think that's the reason why we're seeing so many women run, so many minorities run for office, because the People's House no longer looks like the people of this country. So, yeah, look, domestically we have a lot of work to do. We've got equal pay for equal work, paid leave, affordable daycare, so women and minorities can go to work and engage with us with our economy. We've got a stop the rollback of our access to uh, contraception and reproductive rights. And frankly, no. I mean, I would like to see us raise our own standard here at home, but the, big, the most powerful lever we have when deploying foreign aid abroad is to spread our democracy and to spread those higher standards. 
Uh, and I think we need to continue to do that. We need to double down to do that. It's the most powerful lever that we have. There's no reason why we should have cut our foreign aid package by 35% in this budget. And, uh, and I'll work hard not only to, um, to shift the imbalances here, but also across the globe. Thank you, and Kevin. You already answered this question, right? No. So it's time now for the oh, no, no, I did not. I've got one. Um, yes, yes, we should, and here's why: because foreign aid can be one of the greatest tools to elevate the status of women and minorities in societies. We have seen this conclusively over the decades, and if we reject that tool, we're simply elevating use of other tools such as our military, which we have overused in our national toolkit. So the combination of development and democratization is key to actually lifting up the place of women and minorities in countries such as in the Middle East, where if we're all saying that we want to look at peaceful solutions to intractable problems, that is a place where we are giving foreign aid and should continue to do so. And a wide variety of countries in Africa, if we pull back from that, we will make women and minorities worse off in those countries. And we have to be clear eyed about that. Thank you. It's time for the lightning round. Clicker. Get your hand and we'll start with you, okay. so you're not last this time. <laughs> Tel Aviv or Jerusalem? Tel Aviv. Kenny Matias. Right now, Tel Aviv, as we work towards a two-state solution. Kennedy Malone. Tel Aviv. Trump's strategy lacked no, uh, Trump's decision lacked no strategy whatsoever. And Kennedy Chandler. It should have stayed in Tel Aviv, but now that it's in Jerusalem, it has to stay there. We have to have consistency in foreign policy. Thank you. We'll start with um, Kenny Matias. Guantanamo Bay should it be closed? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Kenny Trahan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the microphone, Kenny Malone. <laughs> in, in 10 words or less, what should be done with Julian Assange? Kenny Malone. Brought, he should be brought back, brought back to the states and mm. be on trial and punish him. Can they call? He should be given to the courts. Prosecuted by the British and then learn what we can from him, particularly about the Russians. Can they try on? Uh, well, for starters, we should um, we should try him for all the sex crimes that he's been um, accused of. And Kenny Matias. Thank you. Um, he's interfered with our elections in collaboration with Russia. He should be held to justice. Thank you. Candidate Co. Should all American citizens upon their 18th birthday be required to perform your military service? No. Candidate Chandler, please. No, but we should promote national service as an opportunity. Kennedy Trahan? Uh, some form of service, I think, would be great, an option. Kennedy yes. No, I'm a two-time AmeriCorps. I believe in public service. I believe we have a duty to be of service to our country. So it's about how do we promote other ways for people to be able to engage with our country and give back in a meaningful way. Kennedy No. Um, I, I love community service, and I've done it, and I would promote other service as well. Uh, not just military. Thank you. Last lightning round question to candidate Chandler. North Korea, Iraq, Russia, China, or Mexico? Russia short term, China long term. Candidate Cope. Russia. Candidate Malone. China. Mm, short term, North Korea. Medium term, Russia. Long term, <laughs> China. Mexico is an ally and partner of this country. That wasn't a lightning round yet. Candidate Trump. Russia. Thank you. Question number five. I think we'll start with Kennedy Malone on this question. Should military, we fix this, thank goodness, incursions into a foreign country will require congressional approval? Sorry. 
Yes. I think um, I think Congress have really uh, have really taken a step back, and I will. Um, I just want to make sure I'm reading the question correctly. Chris, repeat the question. Yeah, should yeah, should sorry. Congress have to approve all military incursions into foreign countries? Yes. Or should the president be allowed to do that? Even yes, I think it should be a check and balance. Um, basically, the, the president should have. Um, there are certain instances where the president should have the approval, but in this case, as I mentioned before, with the behavior of our president, I'm very um, scared of his power to do so. So, um, typically, I uh, again, I think there should be a check and balance where Congress should have the ability to do that. In some instances, they, they do, uh, the president should have that power. I'm just scared with this one. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the question. Absolutely should have the approval of Congress. We have a president who's demonstrated time and time again that he is unfit and that he makes decisions that are irrational or not based in the best interest and safety of our country. Uh, we currently have legislation uh, before Congress that would do this and I would be someone who would advocate for this. We need to make sure that this president does not have unfettered authority to wage war. Thank you. Thank you. Can I Trahan? So to wage war, we do need congressional approval today. Um, I think the question is, can we you know, trust the current administration and, and his cabinet to, uh, or the current president to uh, act as commander in chief? And I think that's where we sort of question the collective judgment of, uh, of this administration. So I do want congressional approval um, uh, on military uh, incur incursions. I'm sorry. Uh, look, we need a. We need a coherent strategy. We need one that's well understood. I mean, none of us right now could actually tell you what the strategy of the United States is in North Korea, in Iran, or Syria. And that's a problem. Um, this is something where, you know, we've had collaboration before with Congress and, uh, and the White House, and I think we, we need to get back to that place so that we, uh, so it's well understood and we execute properly. Thank you. Okay, Chandler. Yes, with the only exception being an imminent terrorist attack or something such as a hostage rescue where there is no time for consultation with Congress and those would be very narrowly tailored exceptions. Congress has for far too long ceded its constitutional authority. It's frankly part of why I'm running because we don't have the expertise in Congress to even begin to claw it back. And I would follow what Juana mentioned about the legislation before Congress, the repeal and replacement of the authorization of use of military force. That was first passed, the first portion of that, on September 14, 2001. It's well past time revisiting, because between that and what we did in 2002, it is stretched well beyond the original intent of those laws. And we have to start from where Congress was with the War Powers Act, in terms of reclaiming constitutional authority. And I would seek to use my expertise in national security to make the case to persuadable Republicans, particularly libertarians, that this is where Congress needs to be. And frankly, it's part of what fuels our insatiable defense budget, which eats up all the funding that most of us on the stage would want to use for progressive priorities. This all connects together. And lastly, Kennedy Cohn. Um, let me be a bit bleak, but true. Um, because of the authorized use of the military force, this president basically on a whim, could launch an attack on pretty much any country in the world, uh, and it's pretty much his authority to do so. That's unacceptable. Any strategy we need to have globally needs to be thoughtful and with a long-term outcome and with congressional approval. We've already seen so far what's happening in Syria. Of course, we were all horrified to see citizens of Syria being gassed by their own leader. But we have to be thoughtful about long-term strategies of getting into different countries. The last time we didn't have that long-term strategy, $2.4 trillion were spent in Iraq after mission accomplished. So we have to be very thoughtful, and we have to have very methodical congressional approval when we decide to, to do these incursions into these countries. And right now, under this president, he has wide authority to basically do what he wants in different countries, and that should be absolutely unacceptable and, quite frankly, horrifying to everyone. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, Vanessa. If the summit with North Korea does not happen, should the U.S. consider 
military strikes against the country. Juana, we'll start with you. Please. No, I think our priority should be exhausting diplomatic measures. Uh, the summit is on June 12th, and what my concern is is that we have a president who's going to this meeting, a historic, historic meeting, and has no strategy in place as to how we can reach an agreement. I think his focus should be on what are we doing between now and then to make sure that we're bringing a proposal to the table that makes sense and can actually get us to, uh, to a place where we both feel comfortable. So I don't think that should be a consideration. Um, until we've exhausted all diplomatic measures with the country and collaborated with our allies. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Trahan. So no, it's way too premature, I think, for us to consider um, <clears throat> military action. You know, it's, uh, it is unbelievable, and I, I like to say cautiously optimistic. I mean, this is a good move. This is a, this is, I like the fact that we are moving a little bit more slowly and methodically uh, as we approach June 12, although it has been a little uh, crazy with the on and off again. Uh, and it's a now we get to know you meeting. Um, I think we need to hold North Korea a bit more accountable. We need to set some really tangible interim goals. I mean, we are meeting and recognizing a, uh, a cruel, corrupt re regime. And in exchange, we should be able to negotiate uh, you know, per permanent end to um, nuclear and missile testing. Uh, that, that could be one. A second might be, uh, you know, full disclosure of the nuclear arsenal, uh, complete with checkpoints. So I think we need to be tough here. Um, I, we don't understand what the strategy is, but uh, we do have an opportunity to, uh, uh, we brought them to the table with really tough, hard-hitting sanctions, and, uh, and now we need to, uh, to ensure that we're on a path to denuclearization. There's that word again. Thank you. Kennedy Chandler. I was once a North Korea weapons of mass destruction analyst in the intelligence community, and I can tell you, we've been to the table before with North Korea, and then been off the table, then been at the table, then back away from the table again and again and again. There is no way that we should consider military strikes if the summit does not happen. What we need to do is to continue that which this administration has a real problem with most of the time, the slow, patient use of diplomacy, and our intelligence capabilities and very targeted ways the use of our military as a deterrent to advance the cause of peace on the Korean Peninsula. What I would have us do with our military is to continue to work with the South Koreans to ensure that they have the best possible defensive capabilities they can if North Korea tries to follow a breakdown of the summit with a targeted aggression. But diplomacy must be front and center. We need to actually have an ambassador to South Korea. My colleagues that used to work in non-proliferation, including people that were fired on the way on a plane across the Atlantic. Um, these people, we need to bring back expertise into our government, and we need to address this in a careful, methodical way. Thank you, candidate Ko. Thank you. This is personal for me as a Korean American. Um, looking at the research uh, of what could happen, if Kim Jong-un tomorrow decided to launch a strike against Seoul, which is only about an hour and a half in the border between North and South Korea, millions of people would be dead in seconds, including 30,000 potentially American U.S. troops and my aunt, who I really love. And so the notion that we should hastily launch military strikes if Donald Trump's diplomacy doesn't work well is asinine. We all know, actually, if you look at what's happening on the peninsula, that Donald Trump doesn't deserve a lot of credit for this summit. President Park, who used to be the president there, was thrown out. Moon Jae-in came in. Moon Jae-in's policy was around sunshine and normalizing more relations with the North. And that was the huge step towards progress and peace on the peninsula. This president, in contrast, as Alexandra points out, likes to get involved and get out of things without much strategy and seems to be much more excited about insulting the weight of Kim Jong-un than any progress towards peace. Thank you, McKinney Malone. No, we should definitely not um, consider military strikes, and um, we should definitely be uh, exhausting our uh, diplomatic efforts. Um, what I'm afraid of with this, I think, I think it's a good step forward, but what I'm really afraid of is our president really being played by Kim. Kim is a smart person, and he's watching this, and 
you know, a lot of what our president is doing with the, his hastiness and not having a plan, basically giving him more legitimacy than he should. Past presidents have done this, have tried this, and they're smart people, very experienced, um, and they haven't gotten this far. So there has to be something more to this, and I'm just very doubtful that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very afraid of our president's, um, you know, him really putting us in, in, um, in a situation here that we shouldn't be in. Thank you. We're approaching 12.30, everyone, so we'll move on to closing statements. We'll just flip the order. We'll start with candidate Trahan. We each have about a minute. We'll just go straight down the table, okay? Thank you, and thank you for convening thank us you. here today. You know, now more than ever, we need a strong Congress working together uh, to, you know, to protect our leadership in commerce, uh, to, to defend our national security and certainly to spread peace throughout the world. It requires experience. My experience working on Capitol Hill for nearly 10 years, uh, writing and drafting legislation, influencing policies that gets families to work, uh, staying competitive, and most importantly, keeping them safe. As a businesswoman, I've had the good fortune of working in, country, in, uh, in countries like uh, Turkey and Peru, and, uh, and I've seen firsthand the effects and the, uh, the importance of our foreign policy uh, and our foreign aid uh, as they impact the, the future of those countries. I want to continue our seat on the House Armed Services Committee. It delivers $12 billion a year to this state and directly impacts hardworking families here. And as your representative, I will be accountable only to you. Uh, I do not rely on money from special interests or lobbyists to fund my campaign, and that's important uh, because I want the voters, I want you all to know that I'm accountable only to you, I'm in this for you, and I humbly ask for your vote on September 4th. Thank you. Can I to us? Thank you for the opportunity and for convening us here today. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you. My family left our country of origin because of the beacon of hope that this country demonstrated for us. I immigrated to this country at the age of five, and we settled in Haverhill with my family. I saw both of my parents make relentless sacrifices so that I could have better opportunities and attend UMass Boston and Suffolk Law, paying my way through school with loans, scholarships, and part-time work. And after college and law school, I returned back to this community that welcomed my family over 25 years ago to be of service. Service is not something I talk about. I've demonstrated it with my dedication and commitment to this very district. And I've had the honor and pleasure of not just serving as a social worker, but defending children from deportation, and today as a state representative for the 16th Essex District. I'm running to represent the 3rd District because working in middle class families deserve someone who understands the challenges they face and who will fight back against Trump's attacks on our values. A lot of the issues we face as working class families are not theoretical to me. I come from a family and a household where my parents paid work minimum wage jobs to get ahead. I look forward to earning your, uh, your trust and support in the coming months, and I thank you once again for the opportunity. Thank you, Kim. I just want to thank you, Chris, thank you. for moderating this, and to the little son, and um, the Shoba Valley, um, uh, and the Sentinel. For um, this debate, I, I appreciate that we're focusing on foreign policies, because if it wasn't for this, my family and I wouldn't be where we are today. My, my first memory as a child was my mom walking me from Cambodia to Thailand after, due to the aftermath of a horrible genocide. Luckily, we were able to reach to Thailand, but it was because of the U.S. and other countries' goodwill that we were able to survive. And luckily, America went beyond that. America opened its door to us. America gave us a lifeline. It gave us opportunity, freedom, and hope. And because of that, every day I've been working to give back. I've given back by helping people get into their homes, building their businesses, and making sure that my American dream is a reality for everyone. My name is Boba Malone. I am asking for your help to get me to DC. I'm not a politician, and I haven't been, 
But the thing is, I have life experience, I have business experience, and I have community experience. And then when I'm there, I will work tirelessly to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to, to thrive just like I did, and making sure that we promote opportunities and freedom throughout the world. Thank you so much for being here to learn about us. Please visit me at my website at www.bobafor4congress.com. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Cole. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to the Sun, and thank you to the Chamber. The only reason why it's possible for me to even be here today is because of an America, an American foreign policy that stood for values we believe in. Openness, inclusivity, welcoming people who are immigrants, welcoming people who maybe didn't have a lot of money but wanted to work really hard and believed in this country. And so we've talked a lot about what we do in other countries today, but we didn't talk enough about what we would do at home to increase our standing in the world and be true to our values. When I was Chief of Staff to Mayor Walsh, we stood for international issues that were critically important and stood up against President Trump. When this president pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, my belief is that was the single biggest dereliction of his duty. We doubled down in Boston and said that Boston would be carbon neutral by 2050. And when this president instituted a racist travel ban, one that would have stopped my great-grandfather from coming here 100 years ago, we doubled down and said that anyone is welcome, not just in the city of Boston, but in City Hall. And that if you came and you were intimidated, we would protect you. That is what this country is all about. Reaching out to those who need it most, prioritizing the people who need it most, fighting for things like good jobs and good health care for those people, and that is what this campaign is all about. So I encourage you to join us. I encourage you to learn more about our campaign. And I'll make sure that that America and that American dream story, the one that made my life possible, and the one that made all of our lives possible, will be around for generations to come. So thank you, and let's go. Thank you. And candidate Chen. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I decided to run for Congress to get things done for working middle class people. But part of what that entails is having Congress reclaim its rightful role in foreign policy and national security. And I will be ready on day one to do that in Congress. I mentioned that I worked for 13 years in the intelligence community. What that meant was not just analyzing targets, but supporting diplomacy from North Korea's weapons mass destruction program to Iran to curbing Russian aggression abroad. I have led intelligence delegations in different places around the world. I've sat across the table from some pretty scary people. And what I can do in Congress is to help not just check the threats abroad, but build us towards a more peaceful, more prosperous world that means better paying jobs at home, that means free and fair trade that creates opportunities here, that means a world where we're not worried about our children going off to foreign conflicts that we don't have business in. That's what I will try to do in Congress. That's what I'm uniquely qualified to do in Congress. I invite you to check out our website at alexandrachandler.com and I humbly ask for your support and your vote on September 4th. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending today. I think we should give the candidates a hand.